Good morning, Revolution, and welcome to this week. Hello, everybody out there in the real world. Uh, we're sitting here this morning with uh, Professor Dr. Joel Wendland from, uh, well, he's originally from Washington State, but he's living in the great state of Michigan. Good morning, Joel. Good morning, Joe. Great to see you. Great Joel, to see you uh, Joel uh, is a professor of diversity, immigration, and civil rights at uh, Grand Valley State and a frequent contributor to peoplesworld.org and cpusa.org and an old comrade and a friend. Hey, Scott, how are hey, you? Hey, how's it going? I'm great. Oops, I forgot to take off my hat. Indoors, Grandma always said, take your hat off, boy. I should put one on. Um, my hair less, but, uh... Well, it's okay. At least you have hair. <laughs> um, it has been, again, one hell of a week. A lot of uh, events in the news. Uh, you know, last week we started uh, talking about images. And the image I'd like to start off with this morning, uh, Joe, was the image of AOC speaking in the well of the House of Representatives yesterday uh, uh, on a point of personal privilege, uh, responding to uh, Mr. Is his name Yoho? Yahoo? Yoho. Yeah. Yoho. He's a Yahoo. Uh, you know, and I, I I just looked up the name Yahoo. It comes from Governor Governor's Gulliver's Travels by the great uh Jonathan Swift, right? And a Yahoo is uh defined as a um as a, a brute. Um, a brute in human form, uh, a human being uh, that uh, uh, primitively, a primitive creature obsessed with pretty stones that they find digging in the mud that represent distasteful materialism and ignorant elitism. Pretty accurate, don't you yeah. think, Joel? Yeah. Um I, I think people should check out um, Representative Ocasio-Cortez's speech in the House of Representatives and hear what she has to say for herself. Uh, that was plenty articulate and eloquent. Um, she uh, took him on. She uh, essentially talked about some important things um, that uh, American working class and uh, middle class and all American men uh, need to deal with, and that is the issue of toxic ma masculinity, right? Mm. Um, Yoho essentially had two words for her. He is incapable, apparently, of articulating his own ideas. He's essentially a Trump stooge, right? He's a Trump follower. He does what Trump wants. He's got no ideas. He's got no leadership. His party and his president have essentially led our country into um, uh, a situation where 145,000 people have died, failed leadership, right? And he's got no ideas, he's got no leadership, he's got no political analysis. So he only had two words for Representative Ocasio-Cortez. And she pointed out that she's experienced that before. So it doesn't hurt her personally. Um, but I think mm -hmm. what um, is important that I can add, I hope, to what she already said so eloquently is that she's talking about how um, working class men um, have used the same kind of language right? in her own experience. And she said, she talked about throwing men out of bars where she worked because they, they use this kind of language. Um, and, and, and I think what's so astute and intelligent about part of her analysis is that she's saying that uh, when working class men stoop to this kind of language as well, this kind of action, this kind of response to women, women who are leaders, women who are very professional, women who are capable and intelligent and all of the things um, that they are. And they stoop to this because they don't have a way to uh, account for their own privilege, their own entitlement. Um, they are essentially becoming stooges of Trump as well. And she mm. made a long list of, of Republican um, uh, politicians who have used this kind of language in racist ways and sexist ways, specifically against her, uh, specifically against her. And when 
we stoop to that kind of language. When we uh, allow that to sort of uh, become our way of, of interacting with other people, we're becoming stooges of that white supremacy. We're becoming stooges of Trumpism. We're becoming stooges of, stooges of sexism that divide us against one another. And, and, um, and, and I always go back, and I, this is gonna sound like an odd connection, but I always go back to Du Bois in Black Reconstruction mm. when he talked about the psychological wages of whiteness. Right. Mm. He's, he's not he there's no there, it, there's a there's a psychological thing that happens uh, when uh, white working class men um, feel that they have a stronger relationship with people like Trump than they do with people like Representative Ocasio-Cortez because mm. uh, of this kind of feeling of male supremacy or of white supremacy, which is something mm. she also called out. Um, we uh, become uh, we become subject to that um, power and we allow it to control us rather than being um, working class people who are aligned with one another for democracy, for humanitarian um, uh, uplift, for socialism, for um, um, all of the things that uh, empower us rather than all of the things that weaken us. And I, and, and I think she does a great job in that, in that analysis of highlighting that point. And she does it in such a way, Scott, that she opens the door uh, to, to, to allowing the people that Joel is talking about, um, guys like us, to listen and, and hear what she's saying. Don't you think? I mean, she handles yeah. it as a daughter, as a woman. You um, know what I mean? It's, it's amazing the way she... Her, it, really, it really shows a, 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 an incredible level of understanding of what, of how ideological struggle works. Um, so we tend to think that, you know, getting people to move politically uh, is about uh, ideas, like convincing them to adopt one policy rather than another. Um, but what she brought out, and, and, and Joel emphasized this, uh, was that it's also about getting people to act in a certain way. Trump's power uh, the, the, the thing that part of what's gluing his real hardcore base together um, is this shared culture of, of impunity, of assholishness, of deliberately being hurtful uh, to other people. And, and when she recognized that, and, and it sort of, it op as you say, it opens the door to, um, you know, it's not just about convincing uh, other white workers of the need to um, support programs that, that lift up African-Americans. It's not just about convincing working class men to support policies that um, advance uh, equality for women. Uh, it's also about getting people to act in a different way because that will open them to working together and, and to seeing you know, this and, and to moving on the ideas later. So I think it's a really, it was really great. And, and also the way that she you know, articulated something that the party has always been uh, very strong on, which is the understanding that um, the oppression that she faces as a woman, um, she shares with all women. And the oppression she faces as a working class person, she shares with all working class people. And they're interlinked, but they're not the same thing. Um, and and yes. that's an important thing to bring out. Very important. Now, this is this is a speech that all men need to listen to, don't you think? You know, and I mean, not just white working class men, but Black, Latin, Asian, everybody needs to listen to what the sister was saying and the way that she said it. It's a it's a case study, you know. Um, that they don't know what they did when they attacked her. They opened up in a certain sense, a whole new chapter and possibility in the political life of this country because uh, uh, Representative Ocasio-Cortez rose to the moment and, and then some. And all of us need to think about it because I've used that word, you know, I have, you know. I check myself now for the last period, but I've used that word and there's certain um, words and a certain psychological and, 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 and political attitude that go along with it. It's like the N word, which I haven't used in 20 years, you know, but um, 
you have to, because we are so infected with racism and so infected with sexism that it almost, and homophobia, that it almost kind of uh, comes up as a kind of knee jerk kind of uh, physical reaction that you have to consciously fight against, you know? So I think that I think that uh, uh, all of us need to listen to it, talk about it, and reflect on. In fact, the party's going to have a, a uh, public webinar where we talk about the the impact of uh, men. We're going to just going to be guys, and we're going to talk about the impact that sexism uh, has had on our lives, right? And how personally it has diminished us. And I think that's going to be a very, very important uh, uh, conversation to have uh, uh, going forward. And there's an interesting um, thing as well in, in what AOC said to a kind of broader question of, of, of democracy um, uh, rooted in language, right? Um, so you see all the time um, people, mostly conservatives, uh, I've got to say, um, saying things like, oh, everybody's so sensitive, right? Um, that's not what I, that's not how I meant it. Everybody gets offended so easily. But the thing about language is that it's in one sense, extremely democratic. It's extremely social. Nobody has a private language because it would be useless, right? Um, so you get to control what comes out of your mouth. You don't get to control what somebody else hears and how mm -hmm. they interpret that. And I think that's somehow gotten lost and people think, or they, they, they take for themselves the right, the privilege of telling women, of telling black people, of telling other oppressed people what they are and are not allowed to hear in the words that they use. And, that, um, and that's clearly, you know, there's a big backlash against that right now. It's, it's just, a, it's a point of equality, right? Um, this is such a profoundly democratic and anti-sexist and anti-right-wing uh, moment. And it's coming, Joe, at uh, a moment in, in the political life of the country, which is resonating even more broadly given what's taking place in Portland. You know what I'm saying? Here you have uh, moms who formed a line in defense of the protesters that were gassed, tear gassed and set upon by uh, a bunch of, I don't know who these guys are from Homeland Security, Joe, uh, who, where, where did they get them from? They, uh, they, they imported them from the border and um, you come from that neck of the woods, kind of sort of, you're from Washington State uh, originally. Did, did, did you see, see that image of them, uh, uh, and, and they're calling this, Joe, performative authoritarianism made for television. Performative. What's your assessment? The uh, Trump administration has made some interesting admissions about what they're doing. Um, Chad Wolf, who is acting as the uh, head of DHS, is, said right. they're arresting people proactively, right? And mm. that's essentially an admission that they're violating constitutional rights. They're arresting people because of what they think their political ideologies are, and they're using their um, political ideologies as accusations of crimes. And so they arrested a bunch of people. Um, we don't know what happened to those people. We don't know who are doing the arrests. We know that they uh, are protected. They get to um, hide their identities, the, the individual identities of the federal officers that are involved in this. Um, um, and they are essential. and it's not performative authoritarianism is specifically authoritarianism and it's designed as um, a campaign strategy for mm. for Trump but but if this guy wins we can expect this to become systematic not just uh, accidental he's promised to do it in other cities um, he's uh, especially in uh, cities that where the majority of the population are Democratic voters where they he doesn't expect to win the state Right. So hence Oregon, he doesn't expect to win that state so he can attack uh, the people of Portland all he wants. He doesn't care if they vote for him. He doesn't have any policies or ideas or leadership qualities that would convince people um, that maybe he's a, a leader that deserves a majority of votes or deserves anybody's vote, except for far, far right, almost exclusively white um, voters who um, 
about 36, 38 percent now of the of the country's population that um, are so hardcore for him, who think that attacking people uh, who disagree with them ideologically or politically or whatever, whatever they think about them, um, is okay, right? And and I think it's a very dangerous moment. I think um, if he gets away with this, I, I I'm almost at a loss because of the the response to this has from the people has been um, powerful and, and like you said, the, the protests have grown um, over the past few days um, in response to this kind of action. It, they, haven't, they haven't been cowered into fear and hiding. Um, no, they're but, not backing up. Uh, our political leaders are saying words, uh, governors are saying things, um, uh, members of Congress are saying things, but they're not, there's what actions can they take? I know the ACLU is suing uh, the Trump administration, but if he's willing to do this, which is a violation of the constitution, there's nobody who thinks that this is not a violation of the constitution. Why would he obey a court order, right? Why would he obey uh, anything? And th so this is a very, very dangerous moment. And um, I, and I, you know, I know uh, the mayor of Portland has come under a lot of criticism from the people of Portland because of his, slow response to demands about the police, demands about systemic racism, uh, the police response uh, to protests, and et cetera. But he, he came out there and stood with the protesters, right? When they gassed them again. And they tear gassed um, them, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> they, and they gassed them again. And, and so, you know, in some ways, I um, feel like that's really the, the um, response of the people, the, the only response that we have right now is to stay, keep out there stay out there, don't, don't um, cower, don't hide. Um, it, it really reveals that the, the fight against the fascist threat is the defining political struggle of, of our moment. Um, the fight against the fascist threat, which includes the fight against um, police brutality and uh, white supremacy and all of the, the sort of trappings that are particular to the, to the US form of uh, or so highly marked in the U.S. form of fascism, um, and that um, you know class struggle right now happens within that framework. You know, um, as we've been saying, struggling to put uh, the working class and its closest allies in uh, leadership of that fight against fascism. Um, nobody, nobody can sit this one out, uh, and it, it it starts in the streets right now, and it continues. Um, at the polls in November and then back to the streets. And I forget who it was, somebody uh, in an article on our website talked about marching from the streets to the polls and back. And, and that's really uh, what it's gonna take. Right, right, right. But on the way uh, to the polls, uh, uh, Scott, um, Trump, Joe mentioned that this is like a law and order uh, strategy. And, you know, he's targeting the suburbs and he's targeting in particular suburban women. These boys are so sexy. You know what he said? He said this tweet, dear uh, suburban housewives, Biden is gonna make your lives more dangerous. I'm gonna make it more safe. Can you imagine he called working women, suburban white working women, Housewives. <laughs> it, 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 it's absolutely unsurprising because you know the whole culture of um, well the the, the neo Confederate I, I keep using that word but I think that's what it is uh, you know uh, forces that, that dominate the GOP now are looking back to that antebellum plantation model of you know the um, enslavement brutal exploitation and oppression of black people and the you know. Um, putting uh, white women in this little uh, elevated cage as these paragons of, you know, delicate virtue and whatever. It's, you know, th this is straight out of, out of the 1850s. I think that the economics, uh, Joe, are the main issue. You want to talk about stopping Trump. Uh, I think that working class people have to stop him. Uh, an alliance with other sectors of society. I saw uh, a, a post from some uh, a worker, a longshoreman, the other day, who said the only way to stop Trump is at the point of production. <laughs> you know, you got to power only understands uh, 
a counter forcing, a countervailing power, you know? You got to go out, strike, boycott, uh, occupy, and uh, a vote. Though, of course, Joe, in, in order to strike, you have to be working. And uh, what is it now? 20% of the population is unemployed, and the numbers just went up this week. And um, the HEROES Act, that $600 uh, extension to the un is, ends today. Next week, people aren't going to get it. I imagine that's a big issue in, in Michigan, where you live as, as well, no? It's a it's definitely a big issue. Um, Michigan has an extremely high unemployment rate right now, um, and I and stopping production, uh, stopping the pandemic stopped production, right? In a lot of ways, and the and and what and it teaches a, us a lesson about how capitalism works, um, mm. because it because it stopped production. Um, in a lot of ways, it stopped Trump. It stopped his momentum. It stopped his ability to be a leader. Um, it stopped his ability to um, coast till November, right? Um, but now what they want to do, and, and then, and, and um, Representative Ocasio-Cortez made an excellent point about this um, uh, a couple of days ago, and it's probably one of the reasons why uh, they, they attacked her uh, the way they did, was she pointed out that when production stopped, and profits and stock prices were threatened, uh, the Trump administration, the Republicans in the Senate swiftly moved to pay out hundreds of billions of dollars um, to big corporations, their friends, their, their allies, um, to shore up stock prices, to make sure profits were okay, to make sure that um, CEOs could get their big bonuses. Um, and they did that quickly with, without actually having any money. They printed money and they gave it away. Right? right, and they did that in, in a matter of days, uh, even before we knew how long or how dangerous this pandemic was. They did that so quickly, and they based it on the future work of working class people. They based it on future production. Right, that's that's how that money is going to get paid back. And mm -hmm. now they're they're getting to a point where they haven't found a solution for the pandemic. They don't have a public health policy that's coordinated and coherent. People are still dying. People are still being infected. Workplaces are still very unsafe. But they're telling us, you have to go back to work because we need to get that money. That value doesn't come out of the sky. We can print money, but the value has to only comes from um, the labor of working class people. And that means that we have to go back to work. And so they're forcing us. Uh, they're using the unemployment thing to to try to force people back to work without a safe plan for um, getting back to work. And that's and, the, that's the, um, go yeah. ahead. I mean, that, that's the ridiculous thing about you know this argument that uh, well, if we if we extend these six hundred dollar payments, you know, people will be uh, it'll be a disincentive for people to go back to work. Um, I mean, first of all, if six hundred dollars makes that difference, then people who are working aren't getting paid enough. But also um, we don't want people to go back to work, right? This is a pandemic. We're safer with people staying home. Um, the only, as you'll point out, the only reason to try to force people back to work is to keep the profits flowing to, uh, to the billionaires. Um, so, yeah. And, you know, and it's doubtful that, I mean, people don't want to die. They're not going to send their kids back to school to get sick and, and, uh, and uh, themselves to the children. And then bring it home to mom and pop and yeah, that, grandma and that, grandpa. That is so disgusting. DeVos basically wants children. She, she said something like children are a, a block the spread of <laughs> coronavirus. And, and um, she also demonstrated she has no plan for making public schools or private schools even for that matter safe for people to, children to attend. She has no plan. She doesn't want to develop a plan. Um, this is essentially an uh, indication that the right wing has lost its ability to lead. It has lost its ideas. It cannot prevent this pandemic. It cannot produce uh, a coherent, coordinated, central plan that says this is, these are the public health steps that you take to prevent people from dying. And they don't care. They really lost don't care. Therein, and therein lies the crisis for them. Yes. And they're on the defenses now. They're yeah. on the defensive. They're trying to regain the initiative through this law and order. It's not going to happen. Uh, 
but because they're on the defensive, the HEROES Act can be passed. It can. And that's why it's really important, folks, to call your senator, particularly if you live in a swing state, call Mitch McConnell, tell him to get up off of his narrow behind, well, maybe it's not narrow, maybe it's a big fat behind, and pass that bill. You know what I'm saying? Pass that bill. It is extremely important for us to act now to pass that bill. Well, we're gonna to have to end there. We've been going at it for a while. Uh, again, we wanna encourage um, you to watch AOC's speech yesterday. Just put in AOC and Yoho for Yahoo uh, and um, watch it. Think about it. Talk to your friends and neighbors, brothers and sisters uh, about it. I think it's one of the top five speeches uh, for the last hundred years, uh, uh, Scott. Uh, I think about, and we're gonna end with a lightning round, top five speeches. For me, uh, Martin Luther King at Riverside Church against the war. Uh, uh, Nelson Mandela in the joint uh, meeting of Congress uh, when he spoke uh, here, when he was released from a, a prison. Um, let's see. Tabo and Becky, I am an African. Um, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn's uh, speech uh, before the UAC committee, wonderful, one of the top 50 speeches of the uh, 20th century. And AOC, my top five. Uh, Joe? Ah, top five speeches. I don't know if I can come up with five. Um, Maybe okay. uh, Malcolm X ballot or bullets. There you go. Uh, in Detroit. Um, maybe um, Gettysburg Address, uh, okay. Abraham Lincoln. Um, good questions. Uh, uh, the uh, Roosevelt's uh, third inauguration, where he talked about the four freedoms, is that is that the third inaugura oh, inaugural the, speech? The uh, Bill of Rights, the Economic Bill of Rights. There four freedoms, yeah. Um, perhaps, um, uh, maybe Lenin's April Theses, is that a speech? Does that count as a speech? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. That's, I only have four. Lenin standing on, standing on the train, leaving wherever he was leaving. Scott, um, your tap. So I'm, uh, I'm not going to come up with five. I'm just going to say that, uh, uh, my number one is the speech at Riverside Church, which blows my mind time and again. Um, okay. the, the only one I have that isn't, that others haven't already mentioned, is uh, a speech given by uh, the Indian author Arundhati Roy uh, against the mm. war in Iraq called, um, mm. uh, I think, Nine is Not Eleven, um, something like it was about comparing the war in Iraq to um, uh, the coup against Salvador Allende. I also liked a couple of Obama speeches. The one on racism that he gave in Philadelphia, if you remember that, that was quite a speech. And also the one that moved me the most was his acceptance speech when he won the election in 2008. Uh, it was quite a, quite, quite a moving uh, moment. Well, that's it. Joel, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having uh, me. This week. Yeah, so I have to invite you back soon. Say hi to that baby boy. Scott, you take care. And uh, we'll see everybody, um, if not on the picket line, on the social media front line fighting for our uh, rights. Take care, and we'll see everybody next week. Bye now. All right. Bye.